Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to, to speak in, uh, in Seoul for the, for the nice conference. So yes, I would like to discuss some work uh, that appeared um, a few weeks ago with uh, Oriam Magoreanu, former student from, uh, I mean, he just graduated a week ago. Um, and this is about, well, I'm glad that now you all know about uh, N categories, so we'll build on that. No, not really, <laughs> but almost. Um, so this is really uh, putting together some older and newer things, well, not so new anymore. So let me uh, briefly uh, remind you of those somewhat famous papers. There is the seber paper in 94, where they solve uh, the low energy physics of uh, super ring mills. And I will talk a lot about that, just SU2 super ring mills with eight supercharges. Um, there is, oops, yes. The second one is uh, this uh, reading between the line paper of Aroni Seberg and Tachikawa, um, also building on work uh, by um, Gayato Murenevsky uh, about uh, the reading between the lines, uh, as I will review, meaning, well, related to the, the end of uh, Greg's talk about uh, the global form of the group versus the algebra, and how you distinguish between the two. Um, and then the, the third kind of uh, concept we'll, uh, we'll use is, uh, is uh, the concept of higher form symmetries that we also saw in the, in the last talk. So I'm assuming you're all very familiar with these papers. If you're not, maybe just go and read it now and we, we come back in five minutes. All right, so let's start. Um, sorry, is that There we go. So the first piece uh, is the seber uh, geometry, seber solution of uh, what we will take in this uh, most of the talk will be just the SU2 gauge theory. So we have SU2 n equal to super ring mills. Um, and we want to, uh, to write down the exact low, effective, low energy effective action on its Coulomb branch. And famously, it is encoded in this, uh, in this geometry where over every point on the Coulomb branch, this circle here, you add an auxiliary uh, geometric structure, which is an elliptic fiber. And this fiber might degenerate at some point. So once you, you know this uh, geometry, you know, well, a lot about the, well, everything in principle about at least the local dynamics. And then the, the kind of basic question that motivates the work are uh, precisely, uh, well, they're almost all the same questions. So the first is that this is the SU2 gauge theory, but um, this SU2 gauge theory has a one form symmetry, the center symmetry. So how do we, how do we see that directly from the, um, the several written geometry? Then if we have this one form symmetry, we could gauge it. And that means going to the SO3 group instead of the SU2 group. So how do we do that? Again, at the level of the seber geometry. Uh, relatedly, the local physics is only determined by the Lie algebra. The Lagrange generally depends on the Lie algebra, but how do I see the global form um, in the seber uh, curve? So in particular, SO3 versus SU2. In fact, this question about SO3 versus S SU2 versus SO3 curve was asked and essentially answered by Yuji Tachikawa in his lectures 10 years ago on N equal to dynamics. So I will essentially refine this answer some, somewhat. So the short answer to all this question is this diagram, but I think I will spend the next 40 minutes explaining this diagram. So we'll come back to this diagram in a little bit. But the short answer is that yes, uh, there are essentially distinct curves for every absolute theory and one for the so-called relative theory in the middle. There are further motivation, uh, that will be the last uh, part of the talk, which is related to the study of uh, higher rank SCFTs, 5D SCFTs in particular. Uh, there you can compactify them on a circle or on a torus, the 6D theory on a torus as well. And then you would have again an effective 4D and equal to description of seber written type. And then you can ask the same questions in those higher dimensional theories. Um, that will, that one motivation for us was also to to clarify some uh, purported classification schemes in the literature. I will also briefly discuss on the question of BPS quivers for these theories. Um, so this is the, the, the outline. I will spend, as I said, most of the talk, I think, about pure SU2, so the simplest things. I think just to, I mean, at least for me, uh, 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 so Greg's talk was uh, very exciting and uh, very dense. So I will try to be a bit less dense so we can relax a bit before lunch. Um, then uh, the last bit of the talk, I will talk about 5D SCFT, as I said, and some comment on, on the uh, M-string theory. All right, so let us consider the SU2 gauge theory then. 
so given the, the, the SU2 Lie algebra, as I said, we have two choice of group in this case, either SU2 or SO3. And remember that SU2 is just a Z2 uh, cover of the SO3 group. SU2 is a, the spin, uh, spin, spin tree group as well. So in particular, SU2 has a non-trivial center, uh, which are just, uh, if you represent in terms of two by two metrics, the one and minus one identity metrics, minus identity metrics that generate this Z2. Now, given any uh, four digit theory with the Lie algebra, we can consider all the possible dynamic lines. In particular, that's what we will do as excitation on the Coulomb branch um, we, when, with eight supercharges. And those dynamic, dynamic lines are labeled by um, magnetic and electric weights. So the, the electric weights are the usual weights of a Lie algebra, and the magnetic weights are essentially the electric weight of the lang lang dual, so the magnetic dual. So for SU2 in particular, we have just uh, this uh, simple picture where um, the, the weights are just what I will call the group weights, are what are the, the group weights, while the, the weights for the representation of SO3 is a strictly a smaller algebra. It's twice smaller. That's just the fact that uh, in SO3, we have only integer spin in, in physics language. Uh, similarly, for the magnetic weights, there are twice as many bundles of SO3 than there are of SU2. And so the magnetic weight of this algebra is the magnetic weight of the group, but there are twice as many bundles. The one with, with zero sitting class are the one that can lift to an SU2 bundle. Now, to have a consistent quantum field theory, uh, as uh, taught to us by, uh, as I said uh, first, I suppose, in, in this context, precisely in that uh, nice paper by uh, um, Gaeto, uh, Moore, and Nitschke, and then uh, in this uh, reading between the line paper, um, we need to, uh, to choose a spectrum of lines, of dynamic lines, which are mutually local, to have genuine lines, and this is the condition. This is essentially that the direct pairing between the lines is. Uh, is uh, zero mod n for SUN, in, in, in our case, zero mod two for SU2. So there are three solutions to this condition. Either you have uh, all the electric lines, like the, the fundamental Wilson line of SU2, but then the magnetic flux are like uh, even integers in, in this normalization, or the SO3 normalization, you can have all the possible bundles you want, so all the possible TOF lines, but then the Wilson lines only start at, uh, at uh, spin, uh, spin, even spin. So. Uh, even uh, charge lambda here. Uh, and then there is the SO3 minus condition, which is a sort of diagonal condition. It's pretty much like SO3 plus, but with an extra shift by uh, a theta angle due to the Witten effect. So it's a case where uh, both uh, electric magnetic flux can be even, but there's some, um, the, the, the charge can be even, but there's some is, any integer, sorry, but there's some is even. Uh, so this choice of line is what is called the global structure. That's what I will call a global theory. And then if you don't choose a line, that's what you, you will call a relative theory. That's precisely uh, at the end of, of Greg's, Greg's talk. That's the, when you have the, the symmetry uh, TFT, sigma chi phi, without a choice of less boundary. So you've, you haven't committed to a global form of the QFT. Okay, so. Now, in any uh, pure gauge theory in, uh, in four dimension, we can consider the, the defect group of, of lines. So in the case of SU2, we have uh, all these lines which are indexed now by, uh, well, as we said, two integers in, in for SU2. But now we want to consider the lines um, that cannot be screened by any dynamical particles that may appear. Um, those will be um, indexed by a Z2 by Z2 in that case. So you can think for SU2, you have, the, like the, you have the, the Wilson line that can appear. That will be my zero to line here for SU2. Um, but uh, in SU2 theory, there are only uh, charged two particles, the W bosons and so on. So there is, nothing that there is no fundamental quark, so you cannot screen the Wilson line. But more abstractly, you would start with the defect group Z2 plus Z2 and choose all the so-called Lagrangian subgroups. There are three possibilities. And then that corresponds precisely to SU2, SO3 plus, and SO3 minus. Now, in a several written theory, we are interested in the low energy effective action, as we said, as a function of uh, the Coulomb branch parameter U, which is the VEV of the, 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 low the, the trace of a phi squared in the UV vector multiplet. Um, and uh, we know that the low energy um, dynamics is fully determined by the so called prepotential F, and really it can be fully, is fully determined when we know. Um, 
when we, we have those so-called photon, the low energy scalar of a low energy E1, a and A dual, because of electric magnetic duality in four dimension, there is no invariant way of distinguishing between A and A dual. Um, so once you know all of those, A and A dual as a function of the U plane, you're done. And so A dual should be related to the prepotential by A, but really what we find in the theory is A and A dual, and so implicitly determine the prepotential. And then the second derivative of the prepotential, meaning DA, DA dual over DA, so the derivative of DA dual with respect to DA, is the low energy gauge coupling, which is what determines the full action. So the Zibar-Witten solution is precisely uh, this uh, clever trick at the time, I suppose, to identify tau, which must be a positive definite um, uh, holomorphic uh, variables that vary with you, uh, with a modular parameter of these auxiliary curves, the, the Zibar-Witten the, the Zibar curves in red there. And then the photons and the dual photons are written as a period of the so-called uh, Severitan differential, which is related to the ordinary uh, holomorphic period of the electric curve by uh, a derivative with respect to u. Omega is also one form. Here. Omega is also one form. Here is just the, ordinary, the, the unique holomorphic one form uh, up to a scaling of, uh, on the elliptic curve. So this infrared um, gauge coupling as I said, is identified with this modular parameter, um, little omega d, omega a, I will call the, we will see in a picture in a second, the, the, the b and a cycles of, uh, of my elliptic curve, a torus for now. Okay, so now uh, I have three slides of mathematical intermezzo, just to be on the same page. Uh, so first, let's review elliptic curve in, in one slide. Uh, what, what really, what we are after is not so much the elliptic curve, but if the full total space of the Seberwitten vibration, so elliptic curve that uh, varies over U. I mean, uh, physics we call the elliptic curve, the Seberwitten curve, the Seberwitten curve. Uh, to explain to mathematician, you would say it's a one parameter family of elliptic curve that is precisely fibered over the Coulomb branch, like this. Um, and whenever you have this, uh, this structure, which is called a rational elliptic surface, uh, you can write it in Weierstrass normal form, uh, which is just this uh, cubic in uh, X and Y. Or you can compactify in P2 or something if you want. And so it's fully determined uh, by these two uh, rational functions of U, G2 and G3. That would be polynomial in, in, of U in, in all my examples. And then uh, in the, in the Weierstrass normal form coordinates, the, this omega, the, the holomorphic form is just the X over Y. Okay, so. Moreover, whenever we have an elliptic curve like this, so a cubic, uh, we can map it to uh, an ordinary uh, complex torus, so C modulo some lattice. This is my torus, my lattice, so generated by the lattice element omega A, omega D, which are precisely the integral of this holomorphic uh, omega here on the, on, the, on the B and A cycles. And of course, whenever you have uh, such a vibration, which is non-trivial, so if it's not a product, then necessarily there are uh, singularities like depicted here where some, for instance, the simplest singularity is when uh, one, one cycle might shrink in some way. Uh, and this is determined by the, the zeros of the discriminant of the curve, even here. Now a classic problem when you have elliptic curves is to find its rational points. So if I have, for instance, simple example, a, a elliptic curve uh, like this with a rational coefficient, then I can find all the solution for X and Y, which are let's say integers, in that case there might be only one, but then rational, and then there is an infinite number. This is like the kind of problem that uh, Fermat and others solved, uh, or gave examples of that many centuries ago. Um, here instead, our elliptic curve is uh, where the, the, the coefficient g2 and g3 are, are a rational function of u, so the natural generalization is looking for rational section, which are solution where x and y are precisely elements you know, over the, the field of, of function on the, uh, in U, so on, on some pi one. And it's, uh, it's uh, this classic uh, mordal weil theorem that uh, the, the space of rational section of, of a rational elliptic surface of our super geometry is finally uh, generated, uh, is a finitely generated abelian group. And so by the fundamental theorem of abelian groups, there is a free part where the, the, the rank of the free part is called the rank of the mordal weil group. And then we will be interested in the torsion part which are a bunch of z, 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 z over z, and z. Um, right, so uh, elements here are just sections which, uh, where you take the, the, 
the sum on the elliptic curve law. Remember, an elliptic curve, as it, it can be mapped to a complex torus, it's just the addition literally on the plane once you uh, map to the, the complex curve. So when you add the point to itself and get the so-called zero section, which is the origin on my, on my torus, um, then uh, this is a torsion section. So in fact, uh, in almost all of my examples today, I, I only need the simplest case, the two torsion. So there you have uh, essentially three examples. Well, you could have a Z2 a torsion section where uh, this is the point, and then you, know, you add it twice, you, you get to the origin. Uh, or there, the, the, the sort of magnetic dual, or a Z2 times Z2, which are all these elements here. And that just follows from the fact that if you solve this, well, you can show that in that case, you need to have Y equals zero. And so you just need to solve the wave transform, the, the right hand side equals zero, so it's cubic. So the cubic has either none or one or three rational roots. Finally, uh, I will need the concept of isogeny, which are um, homomorphism of elliptic curves, right? So um, maps that will preserve the, the origin uh, of the, the zero section. Um, the kernel of uh, isogeny is always a finite group. At the level of the complex tori, this is, this is written like this. So there is essentially a potential rescaling that will be important by alpha. And then uh, you just want to map a lattice to a lattice. Um, so for instance, yeah, so okay, that's, that's an isogeny. What will be important for us is that whenever I have this n torsion, I can ge generate an isogeny by just taking a quotient by the isogeny. And that there is something that is very well understood at the level of the curve, it's called the value formula that I will use implicitly in this talk. But at the level of this picture of the complex torus, it's very simple to, to visualize. Because for instance, if I have a Z2 torsion here, a Z2 point, then I can quotient by this, uh, and I get this smaller torus here, right? And the important point is that we know to all these, uh, these things that we can do, of course, at the level of the torus, it extends over the full vibration, so over the, the rational elliptic surface. In particular, it naturally extends in a well-understood way at the singular fibers of the vibration. So back to physics, the last bit of information uh, I need to recall is uh, that on the Coulomb branch, uh, we can have uh, BPS uh, particles, dionic one particle excitations, which will have extreme magnetic charge, MQ, valued in some lattice. Here, um, I call gamma at SU2 all the, um, all the allowed uh, charges, I think. We'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. Anyway, so those are all the possible charges that are actually re realized, at least any, everywhere on the Coulomb branch, or potentially realized. Uh, the important point from the point of view of Seber Witten geometry is that those extreme magnetic charges are realized literally as homology cycles on the on the on the cyber written geometry. Uh, then the direct pairing between two dions, like this, is literally the intersection pairing on homology. And finally, uh, we have a central charge which is given explicitly and exactly on the Coulomb branch once you know the the exact uh, physical periods A and A dual, like this. Okay, so let's start with the SU2 curve then. Um, the SU2 curve, as uh, given in the second Seberwitten paper, is written explicitly like this in Wehr's transform in terms of this G2 and G3. And the important thing is that the discriminant has this simple form with two singularities that you equal uh, lambda squared and, and lambda, and uh, so lambda is the, is the SQCD scale. Uh, so you have singularities as plus and minus uh, lambda squared. That is where the so-called monopole, the monopoles and the dions become massless. <coughs> Um, so in, the, in our uh, charge normalization for SU2, the monopole is a, is a one zero state. We'll come back to that. Um, and uh, the dion is then a minus two state. So it's important that it's a two there in particular. So this uh, device here is just that each node is the particular la uh, things that become masses as, as some singularities. And then I'm thinking I'm, I'm sitting near the, the singularity in the strong coupling regime. And, um, and so those states are relatively light there. And then you look at the direct pairing between those states. And the number of arrows is the, the, the direct pairing. So this is called a BPS quiver, as uh, discussed by uh, Alim, uh, few, few, many people, uh, Cordova, Vafa, others, um, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. And uh, why this is convenient is why, because the full BPS spectrum can be built out of bound states that you can think of in terms of pure representation theory. Um, but all we care about for now is that uh, all the states that could potentially appear in the theory, the so-called allowed charges, will be 
bound state of those, so in particular, you see that because there is a two there, all the states will have uh, even electric charge. So this is my gamma at, which is, as we said before, a subgroup of the full homology lattice where uh, M and Q are, are integer. All right. So, yeah, so mapping this SU2 normalization to the earlier normalization in terms of the algebra, lambda M and lambda E, this is the thing. So that's precisely that because the only monopole that can appear is, uh, is charge two in the lambda normalization, we have lambda M over two. But that is literally what is dictated to us by the homology lattice of the several written geometry. Now, the allowed BPS lines in this theory are, uh, so those are uh, defect lines or uh, line operators. Those are the world line of massive dions, um, which must be then mutually local with all the dynamical particles. And so this is the, the condition there. Uh, so any, for any gamma in this uh, allowed lattice, uh, uh, you need to have integer direct pairing with, uh, with the line. And the, the, the answer to that is actually just the, the gamma itself that is was we identified with the homology lattice of the of the stable return curve. So we see that in this case, um, the line lattice is literally the homology lattice of the stable return geometry. And this is the picture um, to keep in mind. So this is the magnetic and electric charge uh, in red. Well, the, the big black blue are the sorry the, the large black uh, dots are the so-called allowed uh, lattice charge. In red is the actual physical spectrum in the weak coupling region. So this is the W bosons, those are the monopoles and various dions. Um, and uh, yeah, those are the two light states uh, that, that become masses at the several written points. But you see that all this, uh, these points there, in particular this point, uh, the zero one is the fundamental Wilson line. So it's not a dynamical particle. Uh, so it cannot, the, as a line, it cannot be screened. So there is such a Wilson line that cannot be screened. So yeah, that's what I'm saying here. Um, that is the Wilson line. And so this, um, yeah, so that's the one form. The one form symmetry is what acts on the Wilson line. And you can think of it as a, well, the Pontryagin dual of the, of the, of uh, the, the torsion, of the quotient of this lattice with the smaller lattice. Uh, that, that is the allowed charges only, but in any case, it's a Z, it's a Z2. That is just those line modulo, uh, sorry, the, the full things modulo, the, the, big, the big dot. Okay, so now here what I'm claiming, and I will come back to, to that uh, in the rest of the talk, is that uh, the first way in which uh, those uh, rational section of the separate written geometry appear in this, uh, this example, is that you should identify the modal value group of the SU2 separate written curve, which turns out to be just a Z2, so this is the explicit section of the stable written geometry. That's a Z2, and you should identify it with the one form symmetry of the SU2 theory. So that's something we already discussed in a paper with, uh, with Aurea two years ago. There are some related comments that I don't fully understand in a paper by uh, Chegoti and Kelsey. Okay, so the, the, that's more of an aside because there are several uh, experts in the audience. Um, but uh, it's interesting also that those SU2, there are many ways to describe those SU2 curves. And uh, one, uh, one is to describe the separate geometry as a modular curve, meaning the Coulomb branch is the upper half plane modulo some modular group. Uh, that's not always the case in separate geometry, but it's the case here. Then there is a biomorphism between the U plane and the tau plane the, of uh, infrared gap coupling modulo the action of the modular group, which in this case is gamma zero four. And that's the explicit map. Uh, one um, advantage of, the, of this uh, description of the U-plane as a modular domain is that you can easily uh, read off, for instance, the monodromies uh, of, the, of the singularities just as a kind of group theory exercise because it's related to uh, where the cusp of this modular domain are, are there. So this is a so-called with one cusp and with one cusp and you can compute, for instance, the monopole is, uh, is a so-called with one, with, the width is like the length here of a, of a T operation, and then you do S duality there, so you conjugate by S, and that is the monodromy matrix for this singularity, for instance. The important point is that in the several written SU2 uh, gauge theory, they are both type, what is known as type I1 in Kodara classification of, of fibers, that just means that there is a single charge one particles that become masses at those points. Okay? 
So jumping ahead and extrapolating from this one example, uh, I'll be like a VSS. So I have one example and now I, I claim a theorem. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, claim the following. The first is that the separate geometry of any absolute rank one for the equal two theory will be given by a principally polarized um, rational elliptic surface. Principally polarized, uh, 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 maybe I, I forgot to mention, is for us essentially the fact that we can identify the um, the homology lattice with uh, what, what is a line lattice. Um, well, yeah, okay. Uh, it, it's, it's really the fact that I can identify the, the, the intersection pairing with the direct pairing, sorry. And then it follows then that the homology lattice is a line lattice. Uh, the second point is that given such a n equal to theory, uh, the discrete symmetry, the one form symmetry can be identified or isomorphic to a subgroup of the torsion part of the modal valve group, right? So that's, okay, and, and then I tell, need to tell you how I find this particular subgroup. Uh, we'll get back to that. Sorry, yes? Are the cases where the heat of the baby is not the intersection? Yeah, I'll give an example. It, it, it will be up to a scaling, and, but the scaling is precisely, precisely the polarization. So, yeah. Um, so here, absolute QFT means that we chose a maximal constant charge of line. As we said, there is a simple heuristic argument why the, the, this kind of uh, torsion action along the fibers uh, should be identified with a one-form symmetry, which is that you can take the 4D theory, uh, put it on a circle, then you have a 3D unequal 4 theory, and then it's known from the, the work of Saber and Witten that essentially the total space of the Saber Witten geometry is the Saber Witten is the Coulomb branch of the effective 3D n equal 4 Kaluzak line theory, the full theory on the circle in 3D language. And then in that case, the one form symmetry should become a zero form symmetry plus a one form symmetry. And this spontaneously broken zero form symmetry in 3D will act literally on the 4D Coulomb branch, which is along these fibers of the, of the vibration. So that's one heuristic argument, but uh, actually, well, yeah, it only gets you so far, we'll see. Um, this uh, identification can also be motivated by geometric engineering, as we did with Aurea uh, in, uh, in a previous paper, uh, but it's not completely airtight either. And uh, yeah, as I said, I haven't specified how to identify this subgroup, so we'll get back to that. Any questions on this? Okay, so next we would like to understand um, the gauging to get the SO3 theory. So natural guess is then to look at this isogeny, since I just said it's a torsion, it's a the one-form symmetry is an action along the fiber, then let's just question the fiber by this action and we should be done, right? So let's try that. So you can uh, define an isogeny like this. So it turns out for distortion section of SU2, this is literally this point here. And then I question and I have this, this uh, smaller uh, fiber. Um, but it's important to actually rescale the whole thing by a square root of two factor, which is this thing. Why, uh, why I need to do that? Well, this is dictated by the physics because I need to preserve the direct pairing, okay? So when I do that, uh, these are the relation between the new periods and the old period of SU2, and this is the relation between the charges. You see that it's funny that the charge necessarily has some square root of two factor. So this is the curve, and this is not actually the SU3 curve, it's what I will call the, the relative curve. Uh, this is precisely what appeared in the very first paper historically of Seber Witten when they solved this theory, um, when they had those dions, but they, had, they didn't have this, the square root of two there in, in a sense. But the square root of two is, is the crucial part in, in this theory. Um, so the discriminant of this curve is, is this one. Now we have u squared to the, la so u uh, is a lambda squared, but there is a de degeneracy two there. So that's a so-called I2 singularity. This is related to the fact that indeed the monopole that become, the, the physical charge of the monopole is square root of two. That is the I2 singularity means that, uh, an IN singularity means that there is uh, a beta function N for the U, low energy U1. So that means if it's two, that means that the, the low energy uh, electron has a square root of two charge. Okay, and this is uh, the fact that uh, there is this natural integer lattice, which is the homology lattice, and the physical lattice, which is related by a square root of two, is the fact that this is not principally polarized. That's precisely the, the, this case. Uh, you can write it again on the modular domain, that is the modular domain. In that case, it's the so-called uh, gamma two uh, modular group. 
Uh, okay. Do we scan the Italian passport of two and get four hours into your period? Or you also be scanning the second time? No, because I, uh, when I did the isogeny, when I did the isogeny, I also divided the child by two here. Well, the period by two and then multiply the magnetic child by two. So that is this, uh, this factor here. So here there is a square root of, there is a one over square root of two, there is a factor of two divided by square root of two. So there are two competing effects there. There's the fact that you do the quotient. So there, when you do the, the isogeny, without rescaling, you will rescale the charges accordingly. Uh, but then you also rescale everything, the, old pe the two periods by the same square root of two factor. So that's why in, the, in, the, in this relative normalization, you see that here it's one zero and minus one. So the direct pairing is still two. That's precisely why you need square root of two, in a sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this uh, pseudo curve is interesting uh, in terms of its, uh, its is, is a rational section as well. It actually has a Z2 plus Z2 Mordal-Val group. So it has those three uh, roots of the right hand side of the Weierstrass uh, equation. Uh, and then we can, that means we can perform isogenies along any of those uh, three Z2 subgroup. So if we perform uh, in, in that direction, right, then we are back to the SU2 case we started with. If we go in that direction, then we will get the SO3 plus curve. And then there is a diagonal one, uh, which I haven't written, which is the SO3 minus curve. So here, the general claim is that, uh, again, extrapolating from one example, uh, the modal alteration of a so-called ma mass deform, doesn't matter here, a relative curve is identified with the defect group of the theory. So if you have a, non if you have a, a relative curve, it will be non-principally polarized. And then you can identify literally the modal valve group with the defect group. And so once you start with the, the, the relative curve, you can get all the, the absolute curve like this, SU2 or SO3, for instance. So let me discuss SO3. Uh, doing that explicitly, so you use the, the torsion along these uh, sections, P2 or, or P3. Again, with the square root of two rescaling for the same reason. This is the explicit expression. It has a discriminant like this. So now we will have a type I1 and type I4 singularity. Um, the, the two curves are obviously closely related. It's just related by a choice of sign of lambda two. So this is literally the fact that those two theories are really related by a choice of the a shift of the theta angle. I forgot to say perhaps, but in SO3 theory, the periodicity of the theta angle is, is four pi instead of two pi. And so shifting by two pi are essentially slightly different theory. Oh, well, we'll come back so to that. What's the difference between the SO3 plus and minus in this kind of a, a discussion? Um, well, I mean, this, those are the two different curves, uh, so that's, that's it. Uh, we'll, that, that, it's just because the... I mean, how you can you obtain two, this test, so 3 plus and S minus out of the SU2, starting from the SU2 curve? Yeah, so well, maybe I'll come back to that when I draw the final picture in a, in two, in a few slides. Uh, but if you start from the relative curve, it is just quotienting by either this section or this section. You see there is a plus or a minus sign. And I didn't draw because I was tired last night, but this is the SO3 plus. For this one, you just need to do a, a shift. So it's something that looks like this. So it's just like shifted by of T transformation. Okay. So for the SO3 plus, the light states are as follows. Now, there, because there is this I4 singularity, the monopole naturally has charge two. That's again the statement just that uh, in the SO3 normalization, I could have had a, a, a simpler Toth monopole, which is the, 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 the minimal magnetic charge of SO3. But physically, your monopole hasn't changed, but now it, in this normalization is, is a 2-0 charge. And similarly, the diana has charge minus 2-1. Sorry, the, that's a typo. There is, no, uh, there is no square root of 2. Okay, yes, it's just minus 2-1. Um, then the, the SO3 plus and SU2 SU2 charge are related like this, and similarly for SO3 minus, which you can get essentially by a Witten effect because it's a shift of the angle. Uh, the level of the modular domain, it's again a modular function for now, uh, gamma lower 0, 4, um, which is uh, conjugate by S in SL2Z to gamma upper 0, 4. Uh, and those are the, the U plane for SO3 plus and SO3 minus on the upper half plane. So the difference between the two is that essentially the position of the, the I1 and I4 cusp are exchanged when you go from one to the other. 
So you exchange the, uh, the kind of physics at the dion and, and, and monopole points. So I should, I should note for the expert that those things have also been studied, for instance, by, uh, uh, as we saw in, some, uh, in, in, uh, in the seminar by Jan earlier, um, this kind of domain also appeared for, for instance, in that case, SU2 with three flavors. The key difference is that in those SQCD theory, the I4 is undeformable. Sorry, it's, it's deformable. It's a, it's a massless limit of some theory which mass. But here the I4 is undeformable, so the interpretation is that there is a single particle of charge two, not four particle of charge one, which will be the other interpretation possible. Now, interestingly, the modal val curve has a modal val group, uh, which is just a Z4, which is generated by this more complicated section. In particular, you, there is a Z2 subgroup, so you, which is uh, this, uh, this guy here. Which, is a, which will be the one that we identify with the magnetic one-form symmetry, okay? But there is really an extension of this uh, into a Z4. Well, an extension of this by the, by the one-form symmetry. Um, so this is again an example, no, not really an example of our general claim. The, the one-form symmetry here is only a subgroup of the modal valve torsion. So how do we interpret the, the other bit? Well, um, the Z4 generator is correspond to this point here on this uh, SO3 curve. Right? You see that this one uh, doing two times comes to this point, so it's a Z4. Now if I question by the Z4, I get these smaller uh, things, but then I need to rescale by square root of four again by the same reason. So this essentially gives a slightly shifted rhombi, which is literally the SO3 minus. So here, when you question by the Z4, you go from SO3 plus to SO3 minus. So that's an interesting fact. We were slightly confused about it, and then because Oria was graduating, we put the paper out on the archive. But actually, now I know how to answer this question, thanks also to discussion with, uh, with Kentaro Mori uh, a couple of days ago. So here is essentially the idea. Um, well, first of all, we need to remember that in, the, in SU2 theory, there, there is a Z8R symmetry. After you take into account the ABG algemaly, the U1R becomes Z8, uh, of which, um, of which uh, a Z uh, is broken to Z4, so there is a Z2 spontaneously broken on the Coulomb branch, and this spontaneously broken uh, Z2 exchange the two I1 singularities on the Coulomb branch. The monopole and ion points are then physically equivalent, and we, all, we know that also by deforming to the confining and equal one vacua, like in the separate written paper, they are literally uh, related by an R symmetry, so they're the, the same, they have the same physics. Um, in the SO3 case, it's not the case anymore. Essentially, you think naively because of the normalization of charges, you, you start with only a Z4 symmetry in, in the UV, and then on the Coulomb branch, uh, well, there is nothing, so it's not spontaneously broken on the Coulomb branch. Uh, nothing acts on the Coulomb branch, and the interpretation of that is that there is a mixed anomaly in the SU2 theory between the R symmetry, the Z2 R symmetry, and, um, and the one-form symmetry, the center symmetry of the SU2 theory, which is of this form, it's a cubic anomaly, um, well, so when you have this, uh, when then when you gauge one form symmetry, since there is an anomaly, you would think naively you just lose the other symmetry. Um, so okay, so that's what we see indeed. There is no the, the I one and I four singularity now are not uh, are not equivalent. But hmm? oh sorry, this is the, the anomaly functional uh, similarly to uh, the story of uh, of Greg earlier. So that will be, uh, the, the, uh, it's a five-dimensional theory whose variation gives the anomaly of the 4D theory. So those are background gauge fields for one form symmetry and for the R symmetry, the Z2 part of the R symmetry. And uh, if I do a variation of the R symmetry, I get this term and, and vice versa. So yeah, this, this, those are anomaly functionals so in, in, in deepest one dimension, so in 5D here. Um, now the, there is this, uh, very non-trivial statement uh, of uh, Kaidi Omori and Zeng from, uh, from two years ago, that precisely when you have this kind of mixed anomaly and you gauge the one-form symmetry, the, the zero-form symmetry here doesn't fully disappear. It becomes instead a non-invertible topological operator, a non-invertible symmetry. Let's call it N. And uh, what it will do in our case is precisely implement the, the, the shift by two pi, so moving between SO3 minus, sorry, and SO3 plus. Okay, so here, of course, the proposal is that the Z4 generator precisely implements that. Now, we would still need to uh, make, uh, understand why exactly, but uh, that's kind of a shadow of the category TQFT, 
uh, at the level of the Sabah and geometry, which are things you can get from geometric engineering, but that will be for future work. But that is a proposal. So in summary, for um, the SU2 uh, super young male theory, this is the, the picture we have. So this is the original Sabah curve. This is the other original Sabah curve. Uh, with a two day two torsion and gamma two modular group. So this is historically the first one. The only difference is that we put a, a square root of two so that they're all related in natural way physically. Um, and then they're all related by isogeny. So gauging, if you gauge the one form symmetry of SU2, you start from this, which has this I1 and I1 singularity. You do the isogeny. The isogeny, by the way, the, the fact that it's two isogeny is why the I1 become an I2 there. Uh, and so you can gauge in this direction or in this direction, and that's just the equivalence by turning on the theta angle. Uh, you can go back and forth, of course, gauging the magnetic symmetries and go back there or do this, but you can also directly do this Z4, uh, the Z4 uh, isogeny, which is interpreted as, as implementing the, the non invertible uh, symmetry that, that goes between the two. Okay? Uh, and so again, here there is a here there is this symmetry that exchange the two symmetry, the two I1s. Here instead there is no symmetry. Instead you need to go from SO3 plus to SO3 minus. Um, yeah. So that is uh, the picture for sparing mills. And uh, so the punchline is that this, of course, at the level of any gauge theory, uh, and also in, for the Nicole one, it was discussed in much detail in the reading between the line paper. And so I'm claiming that reading within the line for 4D equal to separate written geometry is the same as reading between the sections. So you, you yeah, simply, slightly simpler. Mm -hmm. Those are the separate written Coulomb branch. I mean, those are distinct Coulomb branch, right? This is distinct this, this description, distinct vibration over the U-plane, depending on, so this is the SU2 theory. Sorry, I should have explained better. So this whole thing is the pi one. This is the point at infinity. The singularity I4 star is just the usual singularities from the logs in the beta, from the beta function. Uh, so the four is like the beta function of SU2. Here is the SO3 theory. The one is also the beta function. The difference is uh, the, the normalization of SU2 versus SO3 charges. Yeah, so this is an asymptotic monogamy for SO3, which is I1 star. This is for SU2, is I4 star. And that will be with the square root of two normalization of the charge, again, I2 star. That can generate asymptotic law. Right? You have the spectrum what? If you start with just two by two matrix uh -huh. for Lee SU to Lee algebra, you you only have this massive vector measure at infinity, which generates a particular monodromy because it generates particular beta function. Yeah. Oh, uh, how can you have different monodromy? Well that's that, that just the same that just your normalization of your charge for the U1 for uh, so here it's because you you have the SU2 normalization of the low energy photon. So you have you have the semi-classical X mechanism. Your phi becomes A minus A and so on. You diagonalize that. And the normalization of the A is dictated by the SU2. If you do for the SO3, there will be a factor of two between the, the two essentially. But that doesn't change the fact that vector measure has a particular charge, right? Given a particular choice of normal. Are, are you saying this is only a matter of normalization? Yeah, it is. Le the level of the thing at infinity, it is. This is a statement that in that charge normalization, the W boson that you will get in the classical X mechanism have charge uh, 0, 2 in my normalization, when in SO3, it's 0, 1. That's it. Uh, but I thought normalization is just convention. It's not, it you shouldn't affect anything. Well, no, I'm saying normalization is precisely dictated by uh, what, what group you choose because the, it's a global U1 which is embedded into SU2 versus SO3. So you have a, you have a different normalization for different groups. Um, this is similar I mean, to the statement I was saying earlier about the, yeah, the charge I mean, lattice. Of, of, of course, the cool, if I look at Gartan direction, is whether you can look 2 pi or 4 pi, there is that always that choice and confusion, yes. even with all cyber written. First paper, second paper use different normalization. Yes. But how can that affect actual 
geometry. I am a little bit confused. Well, even in the first paper, that, that is the first, this is the first separate paper, actually. And then they use the normalization 0, 1 for the W boson. Here I'm saying it's actually square root of 2 times 0, 1. But that's because I rescale the square by square root of 2 so that I can have this relation uh, that makes sense physically and preserve the direct pairing. But yeah, in the, the two papers, they use this one with a 0, 1 normalization. This one, oops, at my computer, yes. Uh, and this one was in the second paper. So this one is the one that naturally generalized to uh, SQCD with NF flavors because it's SQ2, right? So it's already already in the original separate written paper. There are two different curves. The issue is that they are only related by two isogenies. So if you look at the literature in the 90s, mostly people would say, oh yeah, an isogeny is like whatever. It doesn't matter, it's normalization, we don't care. I'm saying you should care because this is capture all this global structure. In particular, you can keep going and get the SO3 curve, and those SO3 curves have not been written anywhere. As I said, Yuji Tachikawa in his lecture precisely uh, draw this kind of picture. So this rhombi versus the other one for SU2, right? This rhombi versus this rhombi, this SU2 SO3, so Yuji wrote this precisely, so that was the correct answer. Uh, but uh, what we did in a sense is just writing this explicit curve uh, that I wrote earlier which you can do uh, following the, the known result about isogenies. And this is the separate geometry for SO3. Yeah. Yeah, I will, I will ask you. Okay. Again. Thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, so I have 15 minutes, so I should be able to uh, cover some of the 5D stuff. Uh, uh, another 4D example, actually, quite uh, interesting. I mean, uh, we go into much detail in the paper. Uh, this is the n equal 2 theory, so that's the n equal 2, the, the, n equal, the SU2 n equal 4 sparing emulsions must be formed. Um, there it looks like, like this is the SU2 uh, uh, frame, if you want. Those are the usual separate written points, and then the I4 is the fact that you had an adjoint, so it has charge 2 in this normalization. And this is the same thing, but in the SO3 frame. Now the adjoint is uh, 0, 1 again. And this is the so called relative curve again in the middle which would be the one that was actually written by Seberwinden first. Those ones were written uh, actually in some, uh, in some paper recently by uh, Argyres Martin et al. Then talking with Philip Argyres, uh, I, I told him actually, well, I think Stefano Cremonesi told me that their curve there had appeared already in some old paper by Philip in the 90s that Philip had forgotten again when he wrote the, his paper 10 years ago. So anyway, this was in the literature, but again, at the time, people thought, oh, this is just a two isogeny, there is no physics to it. But really, th those are two distinct curves. This is the relative curve, and this one is the, relative, is the absolute curve. And here, because it's, uh, it comes from n equal 4, there is S duality. So this is all the same, and they, can, they are related by a, a change of the UV gauge coupling. All right. So the, the last uh, bit of the talk will be about higher dimensional uh, superconformal field theory. Those are strongly compelled uh, conformal field theory with eight superchargers in, in five dimensions. They were discovered first by Cyberg and uh, also from string theory and so on by Witten and, and so on. Um, and they've been identified, especially in second year people, in recent year people revisited the classification. So in the 90s, people found this uh, 10, I think, 10 uh, EN theories. The EN is the flavor symmetry of those SCFTs, the flavor symmetry algebra. Uh, and then uh, Bardouache found the uh, 11th theory uh, more recently. Uh, but for our picture, I, I care about the one which will have a one form symmetry in five dimension. So there are only two of them in this case, uh, something that we discussed also in a, in a paper two years ago, uh, also in many papers by Bardouache and, and Sako and so on. Um, so the, this is the E0, which has a Z3 one form symmetry in 5D, and the E1, which is a Z2. The E1 theory is pretty much the uplift of 5D to pure SU2. It's the so-called 5D uh, SU2 zero uh, 5D gauge theory in a sense. And we, what we do is consider this 5D theory, but on R4 times S1, and then we follow the Kaluza-Klein ideology. We just write all the 5D theory in terms of so, sort of KK modes, abstractly speaking, because, because it's only coupled CFT. But then in the 4D n equal 2 description, the, if I have a ZN one form symmetry, it decompose, I mean, it gives us both a one form symmetry and a zero form symmetry. Okay. Uh, so in principle, then, if I have no anomalies between the, those four dimensional one form and zero form symmetry, uh, I should be able to gauge them independently and do this kind of picture. So I can start with the so-called electric theory, which has a 
a one form symmetry and a zero form symmetry and I can gauge one form symmetry and then the zero form symmetry or vice versa. And so I get at least four theories do, doing this kind of, of game. This would be the dimensional, well, the, the, the gauging of the 5D one form symmetry on circle because indeed the one form symmetry in 5D, the dual symmetry when you gauge it is a two form symmetry in five dimension. In 4D it's one form gives one form, but uh, in, yeah. Um, so this picture assumes that there is no anomaly, so you can gauge everything without paying any price. There are cases, in fact, the E0 theory, there is an anomaly, and then you would expect that this picture truncates like this, um, and uh, that's indeed what we find. So for the E1 theory, uh, there is a mass deformation of this theory, which is like the, the so-called 5D uh, gauge coupling, lambda, where the CFT limit is lambda equal one. So you can analyze this for any value of lambda, uh, you start from this uh, so-called electric theory, gauge one form symmetry, get something very similar to what we did before, from SU2 to SO3 plus and minus, essentially. But these, those are really 5D SCFT on a circle. But then you could also gauge the zero form symmetry and get those uh, additional structure. Uh, you can similarly look at the light states on the Coulomb range. They, they're encoded by a BPS quiver. This is a well-known story uh, that was also nicely revisited by, by Pilgin uh, a couple of years ago, a year ago. So, okay, this is the, the result of all the relation. Let me just draw a picture. Um, the important new ingredient here, as we said, is that we can gauge now zero form symmetries. And this corresponds, when you gauge zero form symmetry that acts, that acts because their response is broken on the Coulomb branch, you need to be careful to preserve supersymmetry and so on. But this is something that is well understood uh, in some work in particular by Argyris and Martone. So we can do that. This is the, our, uh, our, our commuting diagram. So let's focus on this part here. You start from this electric theory. You can do a two isogeny. You get this relative theory there. So this is the generic theory and this is the SCFT limit when lambda goes to one. This uh, singularity here is where there is a quantum X branch that emanates. And so you can go there and then go there and those are the SO3 theories again uh, with uh, I1s and I4 singularities. It's like two copies it's like a double copies of the SU2 story that I told you before, in a sense, well, literally. Similarly, you can gauge uh, the zero form symmetry and then you get these pictures. Uh, now you get slightly more uh, complicated singularity structure, uh, but yeah, it's all consistent with, well, what we know about anomalies and so on. Any questions on this? Um, then, in terms of the, the E0 theory, as I said, there is an anomaly. So let's just focus here on the gauging of the, the one form symmetry in 4D, which I can do. Uh, there, there is, it's a Z3 symmetry. So uh, this is the electric theory. It has three I1 singularity. I can do a three isogeny. I get the so-called relative curve, which has three I3 singularities. And then I can look at all the, again, by, by our general claim, in that case, there is a Z3 plus Z3 torsion group. I mean, mortal vile uh, group, it's Z3 plus Z3 of this, this relative curve. So you can take any of those uh, Z3, maximal Z3 subgroup of this Z3 times Z3, there are four of them, and then you go to all the global forms. So if you go there, this is the theory I start with, but if you go there, it's three copies of the same. This is like SO3 plus and minus. In that case, it's an abstract thing with three, uh, t a theta angle that, that uh, has three different values. Uh, and so you see that here, in that case, the, the symmetry that was the zero form symmetry was the one that rotates the tree here, and here it's constantly broken. I mean, it's explicitly broken, sorry, by the, the geometry, which is a statement of the anomaly at this level. Uh, finally, you can look at the M string theory. So that's it, the 6Z02 uh, theory of type A1 uh, on the torus with a flat connection on the torus, which becomes the adjoint mass of an equal four when you take the, the limits to 4D and equal four. Um, in that case, uh, there are two absolute curves. Those are the same because they're all related by, uh, by S-duality, like, uh, like for an equal two star. But there is also the one when you gauge the zero form symmetry. So this one and this one are distinct. And those are the intermediate relative theories in blue. Um, as a side comment of uh, this whole analysis, which is related to some other projects of ours, but we could also uh, use this analysis of the Coulomb branch of the M-string uh, on the torus the M-string theory on the torus, sorry, uh, to uh, derive the BPS quiver, similarly to a picture I showed before. In that case, there are six BPS states. Uh, so here you can see that essentially each one here is a copy of SU2. The square here is a copy of the E1 theories. 
Uh, anyway, there are many limits. In fact, from the M-string theory, you can take limits to all the theories I, I discussed before, except the E0 theory. Uh, you can take a 5D limit, a 4D limit, whatever. All right. So let me conclude uh, with a summary of what, what I said, and then uh, we have uh, the perfect. We have a few minutes for discussions. Um, let me just summarize, as we did in the paper, the, the claims here about rank one uh, n equal to theories, uh, several written geometries in terms of three conjecture. I call them conjecture because, um, well, they're true in all the examples, and we looked at all the examples. So they're true in that sense, but it'd be nice to derive them in a more uh, physics way, uh, for instance, from geometric engineering or other way that, that are, uh, yeah. So the first conjecture is the, the fact that if we have a, the, the Seber-Witten curve of a, of a relative theory, first of all, it needs to be a non-principally non -principally polarized uh, elliptic curve. And then uh, the defect line group of the theory, did I mess up the, yes. Anyway, uh, what I meant to say here is that uh, the modal val group of the mass deformed theory will be uh, the defect group, yes? Yeah, that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's what it's written, sorry, I'm tired. So you, you identify the defect line with the, the mass deformed. The mass deformed is because, for instance, for n equal two star, you really need to look at the generic mass deformed case. When you, have, when you have the massless case, then other things can happen and there is more complicated structure related also to flavor symmetries. Um, the second conjecture is that uh, for an absolute theory, which then is then a principally polarized seber witten curve, um, then the one for symmetry is isomorphic to a subgroup of the torsion group. And now we, we saw how to actually identify it. The point is that if we know the relative curve, we can go to all the, the absolute, absolute curve. Vice versa, um, whenever I do an isogeny, there is a notion of dual isogeny. So I always know to come back where I started from, essentially, or literally. And so the final uh, piece that I want to uh, insist on is that the gauging of a, of a rank one symmetry is almost what we said naively, it should be just quotienting the fiber, but in fact, you need to quotient the fiber twice. You start from absolute theory, do an, an isogeny, get a relative theory and keep going and find whatever of the other global form of the, of the theory. So to conclude, uh, we also in, in that as further structure. There is uh, some two group structure hiding there too and higher form symmetries. So that's something for future work, certainly. Uh, importantly, everything I said is very much tied to rank one because I use elliptic curves and so on. Uh, we, we know much more about it. So to, we, we certainly need new tools if we want to go to generic uh, higher rank theory. There is also a reduction to higher to 3D, which is extremely rich and important to, to understand better. Um, yes. and. Uh, I think one particular thing in terms of physical, by which I mean, for instance, for 5D CFT, is there is a lot of engineering in type 2A and M theory and so on of those theories. And in principle, all these defects and symmetry operators can be understood in terms of brains. And you would like to see a boundary condition on those brains would recover this kind of structure, essentially in the mirror type 2B description. So thank you for your attention.